ಕೊಟ್ಟು ಪಂಚೋರ್ನ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಎವ್ರಿಬಡಿ um this is our last session in the investigative uh strand of the festival uh my name is heather brook and i'm a professor of journalism at city university in london and a journalist as well an activist and uh this session is about crowds can crowds investigate can crowds replace the role of a professional journalist how do we work with social media how do we work with amateur uh citizen journalists with amateur sleuths um yeah what is the role uh, of the professional journalist when it comes to our rising tide of uh amateur d- detectives amateur citizen journalists so we've brought here uh Paul Lewis who's the special re- projects editor i think that's your title mm-hmm. now um special projects editor at the guardian and he's had a lot of experience uh, and really kind of made it his strength in in his journalistic practice to use social media and to use the power of crowds to find witnesses to find uh, people who know people who he needs to talk to to track people down to find somebody who's taken footage that would contradict what the police might say for example what the official story is he tries to find people who are actually on the scene and can give uh kind of get the eyes of the whole crowd and use that to counterbalance the 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 position that the police or an authority is giving so um Paul's going to give a presentation for about half an hour i might ask a, one or two questions and then we'll open it up to you to ask questions also so please join me in welcoming Paul Lewis. Okay, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, as Heather said, I'm going to talk to you about some of the experiences I've had. Um, I'm going to split the presentation into two. One of them was, I guess, my formative experience, the time I uh, realized, I think, some important things about some of the possibilities that were being afforded to journalists. And this was around 2009. and what i learned from that and then secondly more latterly i'm going to try to explore the way um the way i think crowds work when big news events happen um so if the presentation can appear behind me uh it will aid us i'm just going to begin with like a really important i guess piece of theory which is kind of collaborative journalism as we're trying to see it at the guardian a, a good way of explaining it really is just to kind of recap what we all know but how information flows have transformed this was the very first copy of the guardian uh in 1821 uh and what's so remarkable about that first copy of the guardian was its durability so the the basic model that existed um then uh if you want through the throughout the gutenberg era remained in which journalists had a monopoly over news we owned the means of producing news and our proprietors did and nobody else uh, could compete and now we have a position when anybody with access to a mobile phone or to the internet can do things that look and feel like journalism so the question then becomes for us who are more interested in investigative journalism the question becomes how can we kind of harness that um or, or harness that knowledge harness that expertise uh, and it's not a science um and i don't claim to know all of the answers uh and in fact i would even go as far as to say as time goes on i'm becoming more skeptical of my own theories um but anyway i'm going to speak to you a bit about them now so uh, the first case study uh it was uh the g20 protests you know when there's a big uh, summit of world leaders there are often uh, protests are attached to them and in in 2009 there was a big meeting of world leaders in london uh and a newspaper seller died and at the time of uh, the beginning of the investigation all we really knew about Ian Tomlinson was that he was a, a 46 year old newspaper seller um and that according to police he had died of a heart attack uh and that there was nothing suspicious about the circumstances of his death uh no suggestion at all of any police involvement he was just near to or in the vicinity of a protest when he died um and there were that was a kind of accompanied by lots of what we call off the record briefings so off the record briefings are very effective tools by uh, used by people who want to um in- influence journalists but often of course mislead because anybody who says something off the record 
uh, doesn't need to be held to account for those comments. So what the police were saying off the record was that Ian Tomlinson was a rough sleeper, that he was homeless with a prior medical condition. That was true. That his family were not surprised at the death. Um, that piece of off the record information was untrue. Um, that the family were upset by speculation. And that was the point when I got very interested in this story because that was the unofficial, that was the official line that came from the police. They were upset by the speculation. And yet at that point there was no speculation. So it kind of hinted that there might be more to the story. That he died of a suspected heart attack, um, subsequently proven to be not true, and that he had no marks on his body. And in fact, he had a, a baton strike on his leg, three litres of blood in the stomach and marks on his face, and a dog bite in the other leg. Um, so anyhow, it led to stories like this. This was um, uh, a newspaper, the newspaper which Ian Tomlinson sold in London. So if there was any newspaper that had a responsibility to interrogate the facts, it was the Evening Standard. Uh, but they, like everybody else, were running this story, which was basically saying, police good, uh, protesters bad. So police were trying to help this man, and protesters were impeding them from giving his, him treatment by throwing bricks <coughs> and by throwing bottles. So I started investigating this story, and all I really had was this picture. Let me see, this picture of Ian on the ground. And you could see he was, we could tell this was a Millwall football t-shirt. So the first thing I did was phone the Millwall Football Association and ask if they knew anyone who had died. And they had not known anyone that had died. And then I got my, my um, notepad out and I started to find sources who may have been in the area, who may have been in the crowd. So if you like, chance, looking for good fortune. And again, that, that didn't uh, reveal anything. And it was just two days earlier that I'd signed up to Twitter. So he died on the 1st of April 2009 and I signed up on the 28th. And it was a fascinating just process of observation. So I looked, I looked at my feed and the, the crowd, sorry, the crowd that had existed were sharing videos like this. I don't know if we can have some audio. Can we have some audio? It's, it's become a really big press story at the moment. Um, I was there with Pete. And um, basically, uh, most of the things that they're saying about them, and I can testify as a witness, and I know, I'm sure now, that I was there at the time, and we definitely corroborated um, the details and seen enough evidence there to know that this was the man um, who was reported in the papers who died. Um, the, the, some newspapers have even reported, I mean, they're saying ridiculous things, that, that bricks were being thrown at, at the police while they're trying to help them. That's not the case. And that missiles were raining down on, on the police while they were trying to help the man. That, that was not the case at all. So the audio is not very good, but this is, a, this is a witness to the point at which Ian Tomlinson collapsed. And he's saying that the version of events that's put out by police was not true. Now, I found these two witnesses via Twitter, but what's interesting, I think, about them, and if we think about how witnesses to events normally operate in news events, is they were not contacting a journalist. They were, they almost looked like kind of terrorists or something, filming themselves in a bedroom and posting it online and then trying to kind of promote what they, what they claim to be the case surrounding the death. Um, so, you know, there were many hints like this and it was, a, you know, the technology was at its embryonic stage so that perhaps not too many other journalists who were fortunate enough to observe the information that was being made available online. The other thing that people were doing was um, trying to create a timeline of Ian's last 30 minutes alive and sharing photographs. And some of these photographs were kind of quite interesting. So here's one picture of Ian speaking to police. Um, here's another. And uh, does anyone have any thoughts about what these photographs show us or what they might tell us? Anyone at all? Here's another picture. and a third. And these were pictures that were being shared, shared, as I say, through social networks that I would not have found any, by any other means, but anyone got some thoughts on these pictures? What do they show? Come on, there must be someone with a view on these pictures. So there's an argument that he doesn't look too aggressive. Anyone else? I mean, we were having big debates within the newsroom about what these pictures show because you could make an argument 
that he doesn't look aggressive. Maybe police are on their way to help him. Maybe he's drunk and he fell over. Maybe 30 seconds after this photograph was shot, police were trying to save him. He died of a heart attack and protesters were throwing bottles. It's the really difficult thing about still images is they only tell a snippet of the story. Um, well, anyhow, we had these photographs. They, they, it was a major breakthrough because what you can do with pictures, nearly all digital pictures nowadays, you know that you can get the EXIF data and you can find out precisely where the photograph was taken and at precisely what time. So when we managed to do that, we could tell, um, we could put the pictures in chronological order. So these images are, are in chronological order. This is the first, this is the second, this is the third in which he's walking away, and this is two minutes later, 100 meters down the road. So at that point, we realized that he'd fallen, he'd been on the ground twice. And the witnesses to the second incident when he was on the ground here may not have seen what, what happened here. And this was the place that we were most interested in. So we also did another thing. By this stage, we'd had a number of witnesses. And I found about 20 witnesses, three of whom said they'd seen police attack Ian before he died. Uh, and so we were running these stories that were skeptical of the official version of events. But we used one photograph. And does anyone have a thought on which, which photograph would you use out of these uh, in an online news story? Does anyone want to volunteer a picture that they would use? Second, this one. Why? Because the last man has a baton in his hand. It looks somewhat threatening. Any other thoughts on which picture? Sure, sure. But there's some English people here. Yes. This one? Yeah. This one? No, no, no. The other way? Yeah. No, 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 no. The, the third. The third one? Yeah. Okay. Okay, this. Perché gli elementi dei cani. I cani danno un elemento in più che non, non mi torna. Poi lui perché adesso è in piedi vuol dire che si è ristabilito, però perché continua a essere circondato da, dalla polizia. E poi i cani veramente non, non mi tornano. C prima c'erano, ci sono i manganelli, come diceva la signora nella seconda foto, qui adesso c'è un elemento in più, come se ci fosse un crescendo di, di violenza, non lo so. Yeah. Well, you, you, you chose the right picture, um, but maybe for the wrong reason, but you chose the right picture. The reason we chose this picture was not the crescendo, was not the dogs, and it was, a, it was because he's, it's the only picture in which he's identifiable. So what you're doing through this is you want other witnesses to come forward. And, you know, these other pictures are arguably more dramatic, maybe they're more suggestive, maybe even they're more sensational. Um, but you cannot see him. And the moment we put this picture up, we had a flood of witnesses who were contacting us and the picture just flew through the internet. So it was the least dramatic picture, but it was the most useful as a device. And I think this story was the point at which, uh, of realization for me, which was, you know, for a long, long time, journalists, journalism has been about finding sources. You know, the journalist goes out and they try to find the sources who will help them tell the story. Um, but this kind of made me realize that what journalism is becoming is sources finding journalists. So the sources, people who will have witnessed this death, knowing they can contact us and being able to contact us. Um, so as I say, we had these various witnesses and we could, we could put them on a graph and show them where they are around the Bank of England, which is where Ian Tomlinson died. But even though we had the photographs and even though we had the witnesses, um, police were still not investigating the death. And in fact, other media organizations were not covering the death, I think partly because of the strength of the off-the-record briefings. Um, but then I got this email, and this is an email from a business fund manager in New York who was in, in London on business, uh, and he happened to be in the right place at the right time, and he tells me in this email that he was there, and he has a video footage of Ian Tomlinson and the attack by police, and it's a video some of you will have seen before. This is the crowd at the G20 protests on April the 1st, around 7.20pm. They are on Cornhill, near the Bank of England. 
This footage will form the basis of a police investigation into the death of this man. Ian Tomlinson was walking through this area, attempting to get home from work. Minutes after this was shot, Tomlinson collapsed and died further along the road. In a statement after his death, police initially said protesters impeded medics from treating Tomlinson. This is the final image of him alive. We've slowed down the footage to show how it poses serious questions about police conduct. Ian Tomlinson had his back to riot officers and dog handlers and was walking away from them. He had his hands in his pockets. Here, the riot officer appears to strike Tomlinson's leg area with a baton. He then lunges at Tomlinson from behind. Tomlinson is propelled forward and hits the floor. OK, so that was an investigation we worked on, and, and not the nicest story in the world. But it, one of the things I took away from it, principally, was of course the power of moving video. People ask, how did you verify that video? You didn't need to. When you had the pictures, it was as though they'd been sewn together and kind of come alive uh, in an animation. Uh, but also the power of sources finding journalists. So you can, put these, you can put these kind of magnets online and the crowd, the crowd that existed at the G20 had reconvened online. They were doing their own investigations independently of journalists, but crucially they needed a journalist. I think that's the key for crowds. They need a journalist. They need a reliable journalist. Uh, partly because otherwise they won't be trusted, but mainly because they need a, a platform. Um, so let me talk to you about the second case study, and then we'll get on to some questions. And this was um, something uh, uh, I was talking about earlier on today, which was coverage of the riots in England. Um, so for those who need a, a, a recollection, the riots began when this man, Mark Duggan, was shot dead in North London, shot dead by police, and then there was a, a, a protest outside the police station. It became violent. Um, and then what happened, I mean, that's not so uncommon, you know, a violent protest in one area of London, but what made it such a huge news story was it then spread. Uh, North and South London, um, 26 boroughs of the capital, uh, and then to Manchester and Nottingham and Birmingham and Gloucester, all over the country. So you had simultaneous disorder on a level we'd never seen before. Um, and for everybody who was affected by the story, and many, many people were affected by the story, they realized <coughs> that if they wanted to know what was happening in their local area, in fact, if they wanted to know what was happening on their street, they had a, an instant way of finding out. They could search the name of their street on Twitter and they would have a feed returning information to them about exactly what was happening and where. So it became, for four days and four nights, um, the case that for vast majority of people, for many, many people, uh, they were at least aware of Twitter as a source of information, if not using it themselves. So for me as a journalist, it's essential that I'm on that platform. So it began with this. This is um, a picture of the, the, a police car on fire. And when that picture was tweeted, it was accompanied by information about rioting, and I decided I needed to go to have a look what was happening. And the first thing I did was ask where to go. And if I'd been a journalist covering the LA riots or another civil disturbance in the UK up until about 2009, I would have kind of chased uh, ambulances or followed plumes of smoke if I wanted to know where to go. Uh, but this was a very reliable, it turned out, way of having guidance and advice on where to go. So for four days and four nights, people were guiding me to the right place so you could arrive at the right place and report what was happening. And the kind of information you're reporting um, is really quite straightforward. You know, it's an equalizer. It's no different to what another witness or bystander could do. Uh, and then as the night goes on, I see a, a child stealing a loot. And then, you know, it, there's this dichotomy, you know, you, 
There's what's officially told and what's actually happening, and police say the area is contained, and that's not true, and people begin to value you because you're on the ground. It's not so much because you're using this technology, but because you're on the ground. And I think that's, that's, that's key. I go home, and I see that it's continuing. This is about 2 o'clock in the morning, so I go back out. Um, there's a few journalists still there, and then the BBC pull out their journalists because it gets too dangerous on the first night. And then it was very strange because for anyone who turned on their television, they would see images from earlier on in the evening on loop. Yeah, so they just see pictures from earlier on. So they don't see what's actually happening now. Um, and, you know, most mainstream organizations didn't have the capability to provide that information. Uh, so I head back, and then I see, you know, people in balaclavas stopping cars. Um, they've kind of taken over the streets entirely. And then I see 70 people breaking into clothes shops and mobile phone shops, and they turn up with their suitcases. Uh, it's a real party atmosphere. It looks on television obviously like a war zone. It's terrifying, but when you're there witnessing it firsthand, people are really enjoying themselves. It's kind of a carnival. Um, but then, then, then this is an important part in terms of investigation, because that's the broadcast. But I think once you've kind of activated a community around you, then you can ask them for help back. So you've provided them with something. You've provided them with reliable, on-the-ground accounts from the riot in Tottenham. The question then becomes, how can, how can they help you back? So I want to know, does anyone have a contact for the protest before it became violent outside the police station? And instantly, I had dozens of people replying to me. Here's someone who says, I was there. It seemed quite placid. But then gangs of youths showed up, and that's when it really kicked off. Uh, another example. So I'm writing a piece, a big long story, reconstructing the riot. And I want to know the exact time that the BBC pulled out its journalists. And people do some quite sophisticated things here. Someone opened a subreddit and they started debating among themselves what the, what the available evidence was for the exact time the BBC pulled out its journalists. And they were looking at Flickr accounts provided by uh, producers who work with cameramen who work for the BBC to use those to basically work out the exact time that they pulled out their journalists. And because that mini-investigation is transparent, it means I can look at it and, and judge whether I believe the information is accurate. The same for when that uh, bus was being torched. You saw the photograph of the bus being torched uh, five minutes ago. I want to know the exact time that the bus was being torched. And again, people were doing some very sophisticated things. They were looking at photographs and video footage on YouTube, and they were looking at the timestamps on those images, and they were even working out that some of the people who had taken these photographs must have been tourists, because the timestamps were a different, were a foreign time zone. Uh, they even found, in fact, accounts from the people who were passengers on the bus. And what happened was the rioters stopped this big red bus, and quite politely told the passengers to come off and said, we're going we're gonna to burn the bus now. And the passengers got off the bus. But through finding the accounts of the passengers, they could tell me quite precisely what time the bus was torched. Um, so it becomes very useful. And then the crowd sometimes does its own investigation and volunteers to the journalist without us even asking for information that something's happening. And this is them telling me that in Enfield, which is another area of Tottenham, 24 hours later, pictures showing quote, some kind of disturbance. And that enables me as the journalist to be one step ahead. And I can be in Enfield when suddenly it does kick off and there's some, about 200 teenagers break into a jewelry store and there are police dogs and baton strikes. And one of the things perhaps a critic would say of this method of reporting is that it's relatively shallow, that these are 140 characters, uh, that you can't provide much depth and much context. And I think that's true. And I think that if this was all we were doing, if this was our exclusive method of communicating, it would be problematic. But it's not. It's the outer layer. You know, you have the, the tweet, you can have a blog, you can have an audio boo, you can have more text. And in fact, very quickly, you can show people. So I, here's the tweet of the incident. Um, people breaking into a jewelry store. And then half an hour later, I can provide a piece of video footage so people can see pretty much the same thing that I saw for themselves.
jewellery store. And most of them are inside right now, and in a second you'll see them coming running out. So that piece of video footage, for anyone here who's like a broadcast journalist, it's a terrible piece of video footage in the sense that it's, it's a shaky camera, I'm holding it up like that. Um, and you know, the internet's been a real equaliser because there's no difference between me holding that camera and a bystander, except that people would trust me. And that's the key, because someone could take a video of another riot, or one incident in a riot which happened in a different place, or a, you know, that happened the previous day and claim it was today. Uh, and that happens, that happens a lot. Uh, and I think that's why the journalist has this kind of unique position in this ecosystem, that if I post this video, it will be treated differently to if somebody else does. So anyhow, by the end of the riots, um, uh, this is a list of the most retweeted accounts. So the most influential accounts during the riots. And I'm showing this to you, to you partly because um, I'm very proud to be number two. Um, but I think this list tells us something quite interesting about what succeeds in social media. Uh, so you'll see this is like number one to number eight. And the, the top three are individuals. The top three are people. So, you know, at BBC News, at ITV News, at Guardian, these are not people, these are corporate accounts. They have millions and millions of followers, and yet they are retweeted less. And I think that's because, you know, social media has to be kind of social. Uh, you, you, anybody, people will relate more to an individual than they will a monotone uh, corporate feed, which is what the others are. So they're more successful. If you can relate to the individual, and that works with investigations as well, if you can relate to the person who's trying to cultivate an, an investigation, you're more inclined to help them. Uh, it's very interesting, actually. So number three, Piers Morgan. Some of you will have heard of Piers Morgan. Some of you will not have heard of Piers Morgan. He's a British tabloid news editor. And he's currently in the United States. He's the new Larry King. Uh, and he was doing kind of like what Andy Carvin does, distant witness. He was in America when this was happening, and he was tweeting from America. But, but because he was a, a funny and interesting, he was the third most retweeted. I've shown you some of my tweets. You know what I was up to. But what's most interesting is who's number one. So what's most interesting is at Riot Cleanup. And, you know, for those of you who say, yeah, fine, you can talk to us about social media, but you're, you're a Guardian journalist. You have, like, a pre-existing credibility. You have a platform. Well, at Riot Cleanup didn't exist at the beginning of the riots. It was just an individual, a guy in his 20s who lived in West London, and in the midst of the riots, he decided that he wanted to orchestrate the cleanup. He wanted to kind of cultivate a crowd and get people to come out with their brooms, and clean up the broken glass and, you know, sort out the burnt cars and clean up London and the rest of the other cities around the country. And, and so he created this account, at Riot Cleanup, and he became the most retweeted individual. So it can begin from zero, um, and any citizen can do it. Uh, okay, I'm going to finish now, and then we can have some questions, because it's often best when we have questions with one final observation uh, about the riots and about how Twitter functioned during <coughs> the riots. And I think it tells us something interesting about how investigations happen online, independently of journalists. So, um, in the aftermath of the riots, the company Twitter gave us a database of tweets. And this was a database of riot-related tweets. Uh, we were doing a, a research study and we asked the company, we said, well, can, can you please give us all of the tweets that existed that related, we know related directly to the riots? And there were 2.6 million of these tweets. So one of the things that we did with this database was drill down into it to see what it tells us about rumors and how rumors are propelled through the Twitter sphere, but then how they are resolved. So, uh, if this was a live image, you could see these would be, if you want to go to our, our interactive, this is an interactive. They're like, bar we kind of treated rumors like bacteria, almost like a disease, and the, the, red, the green will turn to red at one stage in this interactive, where people realized from themselves that these rumors, various different subjects, were untrue. 
And you can, you can trace back these rumors to see how it was that individuals managed to investigate them, uh, often independently of journalists. So here's a first example. This is a rumor that London Eye was on fire. So you, you know the landmark, I'm sure many of you, the London Eye. And here's a picture of the London Eye on fire. Uh, and it's a dramatic photograph. And I think the author was this person. So this person says, oh my God, this can't be happening to uh, the London Eye. And they've got various hashtags. And they tweeted this link. And I, my suspicion is that the per this person who tweeted this is probably the person who hoaxed this picture, who used some Photoshop to put some flames at the bottom of the London Eye because the, 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 the picture is a hoax. But it's interesting, so this individual, you know, has just 18 followers. So not someone with a huge degree of influence. And look, if you want to look in more detail at this, you know, you have to look at the whole interactive because we dissect these rumors in a lot of detail. And now I'm just showing you a very small segment of what we found out. But this individual has just 18 followers. So how does this picture suddenly become viral? Uh, well, the answer is with help of mainstream journalists. So this is the famous Andy Carvin, um, who's in many ways very good and very forward-thinking. Yeah, I know. But um, he says, and this is his particular brand of doing things, and, and it can be effective, uh, can anyone in London confirm the status of the London Eye? People debating whether these pics are fake. And he has a link, and it's the link to the fake picture. What do, and he, obviously, Andy has 85,000 followers. So he has a big degree of influence. Um, I mean, there are some people who would say this is a new, interesting way of doing journalism, <coughs> asking the crowd to help verify. I disagree. I, I, I think that there's an implicit investment of some degree of truth when you put something out there, when you broadcast it. Um, I mean, he wouldn't, he wouldn't broadcast a picture of Buckingham Palace on fire with the Queen jumping off the roof because he would know that has to be untrue. He would know that's just ridiculous. So why broadcast a picture with 18 followers with some flames at the bottom of the London Eye? Because you think it's more likely to be true. And uh, you get an interesting kind of moral dilemma with these things, and we can't always get it right. Um, but you know, you've heard the phrase, uh, shouting fire in a crowded theater. Some of you will have heard this phrase. I think this is a bit like shouting, can anyone smell smoke? in a crowded theater. You're not saying there's a fire, but you're saying there may be. And people, to some degree, will believe that it might be true. Um, well, to cut a long story short, people pointed out to Andy Carvin, this is someone with just four followers, London Eye is not flammable, it must be a hoax, paint burns different, and iron needs much heat. So basically pointing out that the London Eye is made of metal, and metal does not burn. Um, and somebody else does the very simple journalistic thing, which is go to the scene and say there's no reports of disturbances in the city of London. Big Ben and London Eye are fine. So actually, here, here we have regular citizens. This is someone called At London Riots. This is someone who just set up an account, regular citizen who set up an account to help report the riots. And we have regular citizens arguably doing a superior form of journalism to pay journalists, arguably. Uh, so here's another example of a rumor. This person says, hearing reports that London Zoo was broken into and a large amount of animals have escaped. And that's too far, that's not cool. And this was a very big rumor. For those who were in London at the time, the rumor that London Zoo had been broken into was huge. Everyone thought it was true. It wasn't true. Um, uh, but what people did to kind of fuel that rumor was things like this. Someone says, oh my God, there are reports of tigers roaming around Primrose Hill. And Primrose Hill is a place, in fact, next to London Zoo. So it's plausible that if London Zoo had been broken into and people broke open the gates, there would indeed be tigers. Uh, and you can see they've posted a link. And the link is to this photograph. And here they're saying this is a tiger on the street outside London Zoo. Uh, and this is indeed a picture of a big cat on a public street. Um, so this kind of fuels the rumor. And as you can imagine, people were posting images of penguins walking along the street and bears and monkeys jumping over walls, and it was becoming a bit of a meme, but people were actually <coughs> believing it. 
But how does the rumor then become punctured? Well, what's quite interesting is it's other citizens. People have, feel like they have a duty to tell the truth. Um, and someone finds out, you know, this is two hours later, London Zoo is safe. That's a 2008 picture of a tiger in Italy. So how did that person find it out? Well, a simple form of investigation. You know, there's a website you can plug photographs into, and it will tell you when they were used previously. Um, so I guess that's kind of where I want to finish, because I think that there are real benefits to thinking of the crowd, thinking of people in a kind of online sense as being a resource that we as journalists can use, but also accepting the fact that if journalists don't do... Or if we were to remove journalists from the equation, of course it would be terrible for journalism, for, journal, for, for, for news, for news travel, but, but news would still travel. And that's the most interesting point about where we've reached today. You know, we can, we can remove ourselves from the equation and things would deteriorate dramatically, uh, but news would still travel in some form and it would be verified eventually. Um, Great. And, yeah. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Well, I, you've kind of brought me to my... I, I wanted to use my chair's uh, prerogative of asking mm. the first question, and that was about, about rumours. And you talked about the way the crowd can sort of regulate itself where a rumor would get out and people would go to the scene and check it out. But the thing, the problem is, what, what if that rumor is, is incredibly destructive? And, and in particular, I'm thinking about the Boston bombing um, where two suspects were identified on uh, Reddit and then it was kind of just exploded across you know, the, me the online media um, of, of these two people that were named and one of them... Um, Sunil Tripathi, he ended up committing suicide. I mean, it's not, it's not, no, we can't tell if it was because of the fact that he was sort of named as being a suspect in the bombings, but his name went out, his family were kind of mercilessly uh, trolled the Facebook page that they'd set up to try and find him. And it's all very well for the, you know, for the crowd to come back and say, oh, really sorry that we got your name wrong and you're, you know, you were castigated across the internet. But, um, to me, that's really the danger of, of, of thinking that the crowd can take entirely the role of, a, of, of journalism is because they haven't, they haven't trained to be a journalist, and, and it is actually a profession. And I, don't, I think that often uh, we as journalists don't give ourselves the credit of the training that we've had, and really it's to spot bullshit. It's to try, it's about verification and authenticity. And it's knowing that if you read something, you just sit for a minute with that speculation with that rumor with that allegation and just think how can I make that stand up how can I verify it corroborate it find somebody to double source it um, how do I go and get the official documentation that will prove in all probabilities this is true because the problem with a lot of um, journalistic activity it's very difficult to get an absolute truth hmm. so you're just going on probabilities like what is the most likely to be true hmm. and uh, yeah, so, so what do you kind of say about that? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. I mean, firstly, I would say um, mistakes are made uh, everywhere, all the time, and sometimes by professional journalists. Um, I mean, famously, the Sunday Times, after a huge amount of investigation, published what they believed to be Hitler's diaries, <coughs> and then subsequently had to retract. And, and, and that was not a kind of impulsive decision. That was after they'd really studied this and thought they'd verified it. Uh, in the case of Ian Tomlinson, multiple news organizations reported that he died of a heart attack and the police had nothing to do with his death. And those were journalists supposedly doing the verifying, supposedly doing the fact-checking. Um, so we, we, but, but let, that, that's, that's not to absolve... The, they, went, they did go to the, the source and the source lied. I mean, the police actually lied to them. So I, I, that's, uh... Well, I think it was the absence of doing, doing actually what... I mean, I take what you say and I think on many occasions, and on this occasion in Boston, the crowd will get it wrong. Um, but there are also occasions when the crowd gets it right and journalists get it wrong. I mean, I think what, what I took from Boston was firstly, it's here to stay. So we can say that the crowd will make mistakes and the crowd will make mistakes and there will be dangerous repercussions. But there's none of us who are going to stop that investigation from happening on Reddit or on Twitter. Uh, there is, you know, this will be how news travels. So we have to accept um, that it's taking place. I expect there'll be kind of two layers. There'll be the layer of discussion among these kind of, there'll sometimes be conspiracy theorists, there'll sometimes be people with 
access to real and accurate information, and then there'll be the layer where it's kind of verified by journalists. Um, but that's a really important part of it. You know, I think that the hope is, for those who want to take an optimistic view from this, the hope is that it's a reinforcement of the role of journalist. Because, you know, I remember very well, looking, I don't know very much about Reddit, but when everyone was going mad about it, during the bombings, I looked at it and I saw the names of these suspects, which they'd got from the scanner, and then subsequently that the name was incorrect. And at that point, the first thing I did was go to the New York Times. You know, and I got a really good, accurate description of what we knew to be true, or the best obtainable mm -hmm. tr version of the truth at that time. So these two worlds will coexist, and hopefully it will make the role of journalist more valued. Okay. Um... We'll take some questions now, and I'll take them in maybe a gr groups of three. So, uh, and if you can just wait, for, put your hand up if you've got a question. And, um, okay, there's a lady at the back there. Is that, yeah. yeah. Uh, hi. Um, as you've been talking about Andy Carvin and how he basically embarrassed himself on the social network in a way, um, I remembered how one journalist from Daily Mail said that when he started working for Daily Mail, it's kind of like he sold him his soul because... Um, the social presence, everything kind of belonged to the organization he was working for. So in terms of maybe Guardian or maybe other uh, news organizations, your online presence, like in, on Twitter, on Facebook, how does that relate to the professional side of what you're doing? Like if you tweet something that might be wrong, um, what kind of level of responsibility professional, professionally do you face? Thank you. Okay. And um, was, yes, there's a lady at the front here. Just here. I was wondering if you would trust a Twitter account like London Riots 2011 without knowing who's behind it, and if so, why, and if not, so why not? Hmm. Okay, and is there another one? Yeah, man in the back there. Uh, hi, uh, uh, do you think that uh, uh, in a crowdsourcing uh, society, people people using Twitter and uh, helping you uh, in the writing an article and to participate uh, and uh, even divide uh, the, the salary or something like, uh, like that because uh, they are working for you in a, in a sense. Mm. Okay, so you've got that. What do you do if you get a tweet wrong? <laughs> and uh, yeah. how do you verify? And but these are one? three very, very good questions, especially the last one. I'm going to think hard about the last <laughs> question. Uh, so to the first question, uh, for a, I think for a couple of, of years... Have you ever tweeted incorrect information? Yes, I've tweeted incorrect information. No, have I? Yes, I'm sure I have. I must have tweeted incorrect information. I've tweeted things that I regretted tweeting. Shall I admit to you, to you what I, I did I think everybody has, yeah. hasn't they? Come yeah. on. <laughs> I mean, in, I'll tell you one example. I mean, obviously you come to Perugia and you do a lovely presentation of the things you did well, but I did something that I later thought this was a mistake. Well, I wouldn't say, let me, let me be more accurate, that I thought... If I could have done it again, I would have done it differently. And it was a tweet about, I was in North London. I'm half Spanish, so I look darker. And I was with a Palestinian colleague, and so he was darker. We were in North London, and we saw a group of about 100 men. They were all white, and they were chasing two black boys down the street saying, get the blacks, get the blacks. And this was a very worrying development, because if the riots in the UK had turned into this kind of racial dimension, we would have seen a very different and very more disturbing unrest. And I tweeted what I saw. I didn't exaggerate, but I pretty much tweeted what I saw, which is 100 men, white men shouting, get the blacks. And then I saw that develop, and that kind of grew into a strange kind of monster. Uh, so various racist groups were saying, finally, the whites are taking on the blacks. And a very high-profile leader of racist, far-right Nazi organization was saying, look, they're doing it in Enfield. Let's do the same in in another part of London, and it suddenly just started spiraling. And as much as you try to get that back into the, you know, the genie back in the bottle, you can't. You can say, look, here's the context, but no one retweets the context. And it was a moment of realization for me that there is a lot of responsibility on this. We think because it looks and feels like a text message, and because we're used to doing it with our friends, and for, as I was gonna say at the beginning, it's for two years people assumed this was a different form of journalism, a lower standard of proof, that we take less care. And I think that's really dangerous. I mean, I think we have to have the same standard of proof 
for information we claim to be true as we would in any other method of broadcast. That's why, I mean, with all respect to Andy Carvin, because I think he's brilliant, and I think much of what he's done has been pioneering, I have a slightly, it's a question of tone, slightly different view on these things. Because I think even if you say, can you help me verify this online, the consequences of providing, putting that information into the public domain can be quite important. I mean, you wouldn't put it on a headline of a newspaper. Can you help us verify whether this is true? You're, you're endorsing it to some degree, is all I'm saying. So I think we shouldn't, although we should be people with our accounts, um, we shouldn't treat them too much like relaxed personal accounts. We should be professional with the way in which we use them. Uh, the, quest, the second question um, about wh what you trust and uh, not knowing who it's from. So just to be clear, with none of the information I was receiving during the riots, I wasn't retweeting it. So if someone said, there are riots now in this part of Manchester, uh, and I didn't know who that person was, I wouldn't, in, I wouldn't retweet that, because that's an endorsement of it. You're saying pretty much that you believe in it. But I would allow it to direct me to that place. So I would allow it to guide me. And if there were dozens of people saying, come to this part of Manchester right now, because things are really kicking off here, then I would allow it to inform me to go there. So as it, it depends what you're using the information for. And Heather and I teach classes sometimes together and I think one of the key things that I certainly try to teach is that um, someone is only an online identity until you meet them. So they don't really become a source in the way you would trust a source, the way an investigative journalist trusts a source until you meet them face to face. But it can be a very good gateway mechanism, stepping stone for meeting sources. Um, the final question was the most difficult question. Somebody said, should I share my salary with all of these other people who've helped me? Um, no. <laughs> you know, we, 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 you know, we have the, the economic model sustaining journalism is currently so bad uh, that I don't want to make it worse by proposing that. I mean, uh, seriously though, I think I said in a session earlier, and people came, and some gentlemen here came and asked me about it afterwards, that because of the economic situation, we have to envisage journalists or journalism as a kind of voluntary function, something people do not because they're paid to do it, but because it helps society, and, and that, by that I didn't mean that none of us should be paid. I think s some of us will be paid, and you know, it will be a shrinking number, that's for sure, uh, in the foreseeable future. But those of us who are paid should be working in collaboration with the many, many more people who are doing it voluntarily. Because people view it as a public good. You know, when people are finding those examples of rumours on Twitter and disproving them, it's because they see journalism as something that helps society and makes it a better place. Um, and if they'll do it voluntarily, then it's to the benefit of all of us, I think. A couple of uh, question, other questions? Yeah, sorry. Hello. Um, yeah, I just want to ask you whether, what do you think? Um, do you think that um, social media can bring good or bad impact to future journalism? And then if you think so, and then what about the quality of content itself? Thank you. Sorry, the quality of? Quality of content. Of content. content. Yeah. Okay. Mm. And uh, who else wants to ask a question, just so I don't miss anybody out? Anybody else? Okay. I wanted to ask you mm. um, also, Paul, mm. about um, conspiracies. Um, do you think we're moving into a kind of golden age of propaganda? where increasingly, because so much of the internet is anonymous, and because so often uh, the, the truth can be a bit prosaic, whereas um, fiction can be incredibly dramatic and interesting, and mm. so it can just spread like wildfire, and the time it takes to prove it to being true to, you know, is quite, quite lengthy. Mm. It doesn't make for as good of a story. Do you think we might be moving to an age of propaganda? Yeah, and I think that answers, if I can answer your question in the same uh, answer. Uh, yeah, because the thing is, um, it's like the pictures of tigers on the street in London. It's more interesting sometimes. The, the, uh, lies can be more interesting than truth, and they can, follow, they can travel faster. But, and I think that, um, you know, because we are professionals, journalists, we, and because we, you know, our future, our salaries depend on not making mistakes, we try really hard not to do it. But other people out there who are simply passing information along the chain don't have that same responsibility. They don't have the same incentive to keep make things true. Um, so I think that we will be seeing more and more pro kind of proliferation of conspiracy, but also just kind of wildly wrong information. Um, 
And actually, probably, you know, we might be in a, because, you know, at the moment we're in this stage where for us it's like kind of get to the story first and tell it as quickly as you can, especially with breaking news. But we might be coming to a situation in which the real value in journalists is not what they publish or broadcast, but what they choose not to, you know, what they avoid publishing. So if you want to know the truth, it's kind of the truth proven by a negative, the fact that we're not running that line, we're not circulating that piece of information. That's I mean, actually coming full circle, though, because um, old, Reuters, uh, old Reuters training was that it's not just about what you publish, it's what you don't publish. And they used to, that was part of the sort of old training in like the 50s. Yeah. So you think we're sort of going... Well, I, I think, that, I mean, I'm just thinking of it as the pers from the perspective of the user. I mean, 10 minutes before I came in here, I was talking to some people about what happened in Rome today. Uh, you know, most of you will have known that some two police officers were shot by some, you know, guy with a gun. And the amount of information they had was just remarkable. They knew that this guy, his brother said he wasn't crazy, uh, he's uh, divorced, um, that he's lost his job supposedly because of the financial crisis. Um, this is a remarkable amount of information to know, and yet they hadn't got it from any news organizations. They just kind of absorbed this through osmosis, through information that was being shared among their friends. Now, I, I doubt all of that information is true. Some of it might be, other bits might not. But after a while, uh, what those people will really want is actually just information which is accurate because they haven't got time for the inaccurate information. I mean, and this is the thing that I think will be, uh, this is the biggest danger with social media, I think, is that it can just be too boring for people sometimes. It can just be too chaotic. People have got lives to, to lead. And you know, they, for most people, we can talk about collaboration um, but actually for, people, for lots of people, journalism is something that they will do passively. They will just read it. And so for those people, they don't want to necessarily see this whole process. They just want to see the, the product at the end. But that's another endorsement of, of journalism, you know. And I want to say one other thing, which is that I think that the biggest value we have as journalists is definitely the professional element. I mean, the last year I've been working on a book. Um, and it's a book about undercover policing. So it's pretty much solely reliant upon meeting sources who, and convincing them to speak with me off the record and providing documents. And it's just impossible to think of an investigation like that done by a crowd. Because you're trying to find out something that people don't want you to know and it's not in the public realm. There are no pictures of it. You, know, there, you can't find any record of it existing publicly. It's all private information. If you like, it's locked up. And you know, the crowds will never will never be able to get that information unless it's through a leak of some kind, a data leak. Uh, and so I think if we over rely upon thinking of crowds for investigations, we'll lose a huge amount. And so I think the best place we can be is where we, we, we take what we can gain from it, but make sure we don't, we don't do that at the expense of really important long-term source cultivation. Great. Well, it looks like we might be coming full circle. Um, yeah, because I, I know both Paul and I were very, uh, I don't want to say utopianistic, but definitely very optimistic about, you know, social media and mm. hackers and how all this kind of uh, new digital age was going to revolutionize uh, everything. But it almost, it seems like it was a, it was a fashion. Um, and now we kind of put it into perspective that technology doesn't change, you know, humanity remains the same. And we, use the t we can use the technology as it best serves our interests, mm. you know, that as it best kind of gives information, but it's not the sort of... Uh, it's not the sort of solution to all the world's ills. So, yeah, maybe we'll even start seeing newspapers again as a great way to find out the news the yeah. next day. That won't happen. <laughs> that won't happen. But, um, I mean, I was thinking someone... I always... I love this festival in Perugia. I think it's amazing. I came last year, and uh, I learned a lot from it. And uh, someone said something to me which I thought was a really interesting idea. I mean, lots of people are inventing startups, and they're all kind of digitally interesting startups, and they involve apps, and often they don't involve very much money, and um, people are trying to kind of reinvent something technologically. And this individual said, well, look, a really good idea is actually just to come up with one good story a month that is, in a, say, in Italy, like one that covers the biggest story of the month, and it does it superbly well, and it does it with, say, some video, but long form, and it's very, very long. And if you want to know that subject, it's almost like, you know, a, half a book or something. If you want to know that subject, you'll purchase that piece of journalism. Because it, there's certain subjects that we want to be on top of, things that happen, we want to know the, them inside out. 
And I think if, if someone did that, you know, if they provided on a regular basis really good, high-quality caliber journalism on one important subject a month, I can see that as a clever startup business model. Um, because the biggest challenge for all of us at the moment is the chaos, is sorting that chaos and cutting through that and providing you know, reliable, accurate information. I think whoever emerges from this kind of state of transition as the journalist or the journalistic organization that is most trusted, has the highest degree of credibility, I think they're destined to succeed. Great. Well, I hope you'll join me in thanking Paul Lewis, really thought-provoking and uh, interesting. Thanks for coming Cheers. to the Buonasera, scusate una comunicazione di servizio. Scusate, una comunicazione di servizio. L'incontro con Ioanni Sanchez alla sala dei notari alle 19 è stato posticipato alle 21, mentre l'incontro Vaticano Due Papi Mille Silenzi con Gianluigi Nuzzi è stato spostato dalla sala dei notari alla sala Raffaello presso l'hotel Brufani alla stessa ora. Grazie.